Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. We've been looking at the fruit of the Spirit, and uh, we're, we're just about to the end of, of this series. I've been realizing the, the key, one of the keys to the fruit of the Spirit is walking in the Spirit. We know all we want to know about the individual fruit of the Spirit, but if we're not walking in the Spirit, uh, all that knowledge is not going to make too much difference. But Galatians chapter 5, let me read just a few verses, starting in verse 22. The Bible says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. So the Bible says, what he's saying there is if we live in the Spirit, if you're saved, if you have the Holy Spirit, you need to walk in the Spirit. You need to listen to the Holy Spirit. Let him lead you and guide you. Uh, back in verse 18, he talks about if you be led of the Spirit. In verse 16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill uh, the lust of the flesh. So, walking in the Spirit and uh, allowing God's Holy Spirit to work His, His fruit through us. It's a, it's a challenge. It's a blessing. I mean, aren't you glad you, you have the Holy Spirit? Um, we're, we're to the last one, temperance. Now, the word temperance in English has come to mean not drinking. Now, I don't know if that's common nowadays, but some years ago they used to have what they called the temperance movement. And so it kind of distorted the word a little bit. Uh, that's not all that it means. Uh, but it came to mean, to a lot of people, not drinking. So a lot of people now use the term um, self-control. I couldn't think what it was. <laughs> self-control. And that doesn't really express the, the whole idea either. Uh, yeah, obviously, this was, was not written in English, but uh, there's a meaning that God is getting across here. Uh, the word temperance, the Greek word that it's taken from, means strength. Strength. Um, the, the opposite of temperance is expressed in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, where, you know, in the Greek, and in a lot of languages, you just put a, an A in front of it, and it's not, you know, not strong. Uh, well, the word in, in 1 Corinthians 7, 9 is, is the negative of, of temperance, when he says, but if they cannot contain... Let them marry. <laughs> He's talking about um, uh, marriage and so on. And um, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Good to stay single, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. Um, so I, I thought that's a, that's a pretty good picture. Now, to me, when I picture something containing something, I picture a bucket. <laughs> you know, something contains something. And... Uh, Haggai had a, a real good illustration of that. Now, Haggai is one of those books that's real hard to find because it's only, yeah, I think it's 38 verses long or something. Haggai. Let, let me just read it to you. It's Haggai 1, verse 6. He says, You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you have not enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. And here, here's the part. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. You ever felt like that? Yeah, you're earning money, but it's, you know, where's it going? Yeah, yeah. it's like the one guy said, if money talks, all it says to me is goodbye. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not being contained. You're not, you're not keeping it. You're not getting the benefit of it. And uh, that's, that's what he's talking about here with, with the fruit of the Spirit. Um, you know, as, as Christians, there has to be... Uh, God has to give us the strength to contain and use the things that he intends uh, for our Christian lives. Um, now, the holes in our life, you know, we're talking about a bag with holes, the holes become obvious when you put them to the test. You, know, you can have a bag and you say, oh, you know, got this bag, it's a great bag, and then you put something in it and stuff comes out because you know, there's holes. I experienced that one time. Uh, I hate to even share the story, but uh, um, yeah, I won't. 
I was handed a bag and I put some stuff in it and uh, it started coming out. <laughs> it was no good. Uh, and, and you know, sometimes in our lives we don't realize that we don't have temperance until the test comes, you know, until the, the, the trial of life comes. And you'd have to have known my father, but he had a real, he didn't like that, that term self-control, mainly because it's got the word self in it. Uh, and really, when you think about it, it's not self-controlling. It's self-controlled by the Spirit is what he's talking about. We're not trying to strengthen, you know, oh, I can do it kind of a thing. It's I can't do it, but Lord, you help me. You, you give me the strength. Um, there's, a, there's a verse in Acts 24, verse 25, where they use that same word. It's not used real often in the New Testament. But Acts 24, verse 25 uses the word temperance. And it's when Paul is preaching to Felix. Do you remember uh, as Paul was, he had opportunity to speak to different ones when he was being tried and, and so on. And Acts 24, verse 25 says, uh, verse 24, after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So Paul got to witness to him. And listen to what he said to him. And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance and judgment to come isn't that an interesting combination Paul talked to Felix about righteousness temperance and judgment to come as he did that Felix trembled and answered go thy way for this time when I have a convenient season I'll call for thee it affected him emotionally but he didn't make a decision uh, but think about those those three things righteousness temperance and judgment to come there's only one of those that we have a a real part in, and that's temperance. Righteousness, God sets what's righteous. You know, when, when we're preaching righteousness, we're not preaching our righteousness. Our opinion doesn't make any difference. Judgment, that's God. But temperance is how we respond to God's righteousness. Judgment is how God responds to our response. <laughs> um, so he, he preaches to him about righteousness, temperance, Temperance means strength under control. It, well, no, that's not exactly right. It means we use the term self-control, uh, giving our, our control of our life to the, to the Lord. So when, when trouble comes and we don't have that, we don't respond with the strength of the Lord, you know, it's like a bag with holes. Things start coming apart, and we see our weakness. We see, oh, I haven't responded by trusting the Lord. And our response to that is often, how could God let this happen? <laughs> you know, uh, we're the one with the problem, but we say, we think, oh, you know, why did God let this happen? Or we just say, oh, well, I'm, I'm really a good person. This is just kind of an aberration. This, this is not the norm. You know, we come up with all kinds of excuses, but we need to believe God's righteousness. We need to believe his coming judgment. And we need to really to repent of our lack of temperance, our lack of trusting him, our lack of him being able to give us the strength that we need. Now, sometimes temperance involves sin. You know, sometimes there's a, there's a temptation and, you know, we should resist, but we don't. You know, we say, ah, give in to it. Sometimes temperance involves privileges. Now, we're going to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and let me explain that. Sometimes you'll get an opportunity to do something, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's a good opportunity. But it's going to hinder your Christian life. Now, the, the example he gives, he gives several examples here, and we'll, we'll look at it in just a minute. So, sometimes temperance, you know, we're, we're tempted, and we have to say, Lord, help me. Lord, keep me from sinning. Other times, we have an opportunity. We have a privilege. And we have to say, well, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, let me show you what I mean here. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And the, the illustration is the Apostle Paul. Um, chapter 9, he, he says, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? You know, he had apostolic privilege, you might say. There was things he could do that none of us can do. We're not apostles. He was. Uh, verse 6 um, or I only and Barnabas, have we not power to forbear working? Uh, who goeth to war for it, warfare any time at his own charge? He said, uh, we, could, we could ask people to pay us for what we're doing, 
to support us as, in our, our ministry. Um, you know, he had that, that privilege. In fact, in verse 9, he quotes Old Testament law when he says, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. And he says, God's not talking there about oxen. He's talking about us. He said, I could, have, I could have asked people to pay me for what I do as an apostle. Uh, verse 14, he even says, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. So he's not saying it's wrong for a pastor or a preacher to get paid. But listen to what he says. Verse 15, But I've used none of these things. Uh, verse, verse 18, he says, Why? What is my reward then? Verily, when I preach the gospel... I may make the gospel of Christ without charge that I abuse not my power in the gospel. He said, I don't ask people to pay me. I don't ask them to support me because I, I, want, it to, I want to make the gospel free. I don't want people to be able to say, oh, that Paul, he's only in it for the money. Now, if you read First and Second Peter, you'll see there's a lot of religion that's, where people are just in it for the money. Scientology is an, an example. That guy just decided, I think I'll start a religion. There's a lot of money in religion. He, that's his testimony. That's his own. That's what he said. Uh, he made up the world's weirdest religion, and people believe it. Uh, but as Christian, as Paul didn't want people to say, "Oh, that Paul, he's only in it for the money." Now, he, as he showed the Old Testament, Jesus both said he could have, he could have said, "You know, you, you church, you need to pay me, and you know, when I come, you need to help me with this or that and the other thing." But he said, "I, I want to make it free." Verse nineteen. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Yeah, let me read on. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. He said, that even though he could have taken money, he said, I didn't do it because I think it'll help me to reach more people. That was his, his motivation. And then thirdly, verse 24, and this is, we're going to look at this for a little while. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate, there's our word, in all things. Self-control, under God's control. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. Uh, he contained himself. He, he limited himself. So I, I wanted you to see both sides of this thing of temperance. We often think of it in relation to temptation to sin. Oh, I, you know, I, I don't want to sin. Uh, Lord, help me. But sometimes there's choices that we need to make. Uh, living a certain place, marrying a certain person, getting a certain job. Uh, you could go on and on, couldn't you? Uh, where we need to just stop and think, well, is that what the Lord wants for me? Is that what would give me the best ministry that he intends for me? And, and Paul, in his specific situation, uh, limited himself in a couple of areas that he had perfect freedom to do before God. And he did that because of these reasons. He wanted to make the gospel free. He wanted to win as many as possible. He wanted to gain a lasting reward. He said he became all things to all men. Now, uh, don't, don't make that more than it is. But uh, I guess the question I would ask us tonight is, what do we want to win? You know, what, what do we want to accomplish with our life? If we're going to walk in the Spirit, this I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It, it, it's like two different directions. You can't go two ways at once. Uh, Try, try putting your foot on a boat and one foot on the land and see, see if you can go both ways at once. You'll, you'll soon discover there's a limit to that. <laughs> and it's the same spiritually. You know, we can't walk in the flesh and in the spirit both. And uh, God can help us to practice temperance. Uh, we use the term self-control, but it's our self controlled by the Holy Spirit, uh, God working in us. And the illustration, one of the illustrations he uses here 
is that of athletics, sports. Now we live in a sports mad world, don't we? And most of us have a, a, a basic understanding. People who are involved in serious sports take it very seriously, don't they? You, you know, it, it affects what they eat, how they sleep. You know, some of them have all these trainers and, you know, you see these tennis players. They got, you know, I've got a racket. I got it when I was 16. What does that mean? It's, uh, it's 50 years old. <laughs> it's about that big around. <laughs> uh, they've got 100 rackets. They can smash them up. You know, they got all this stuff. They take it very seriously, don't they? And that's what, what Paul, is the illustration he's, he's making there. Uh, every man, verse 25, every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. There's a control. And, uh, you know, as uh, that, that word mastery means to enter a contest, uh, to contend, to contend many times with an adversary. And, you know, hopefully you don't go into a contest to lose. You go in to win. I mean, that's, that's the norm. And he says, as Christians, we shouldn't live our lives to lose. But we should live our lives to win, to live for the Lord. And uh, later on, Paul was able to say in 2 Timothy 4, verse 7, I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. And I think that's probably what most of us want to be able to say. You know, when we come to the end of the line, I've, I've fought a good fight, I've finished my course, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown, a crown of righteousness. And to do that, it meant that he had to rely on the Lord. I noticed there's several verses, I'll just mention them. Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Paul realized that his strength came from the Lord. Now, Colossians 1, uh, verse 11, he says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Uh, he had looked to the Lord for strength in, in whatever his situation was. Uh, he looked to the Lord for, for temperance. So we see the, the illustration of, of the athlete, uh, what they do, what they don't do. You know, as Christians, there's things we need to do. There's things we need to be careful we don't do. And we need to look to the Lord for what he would have us to do. Uh, let me give you a couple of other Bible examples, and then, then we'll quit. But I feel like I've used this fellow several times lately. Uh, that's the man Joseph in Genesis 39. Do you remember Joseph, whose, whose brothers sold him into slavery? Genesis 39, verse 7. He practiced temperance. He became a, he was a slave. And he, listen to what it says. Genesis 39, verse 7. It came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast her eyes upon Joseph, and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master wotteth not what is with me in the house. He doesn't know what's, what's going on here. And he hath committed all that he hath to my hand. There's none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Uh, Joseph was showing temperance there. He was looking to God uh, for self-control. To, to strengthen him. He recognized sin. And he knew that if he were to, to not be contained, if he were to let things spring through the holes, uh, it would harm his master. But especially it would be a sin against God. And that's a key. That's a real key understanding uh, of life. The main reason we need to let God control us is so that we don't do the wrong thing. He recognized sin. Another man is uh, Daniel in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 8. Ezekiel, Daniel. Daniel was again a, a young man taken captive, uh, not completely in control of his own life. Daniel 1 verse 5 explains the situation. It says, The king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Uh, when we went to Bible college, it was three years. So I guess this was the Babylonian Bible college. <laughs> I'm not sure. 
Uh, but they had to eat and drink all the things and get the training and so on. Well, verse 8. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. So there was something about what they were offering that didn't fit in with, with what God had said they should eat and drink. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, you, you need to understand this situation. He's, he's a captive, basically a slave, and been put in training to, you know, to, serve, to serve the king. But he had just purposed not to defile himself. He was wanting God to show him what to do. He was looking for temperance. He didn't want to be uncontained. He wanted God to contain him, to, to make him what he should be. Uh, we had this as one of the uh, main lessons at one of the youth camps a few years ago, and uh, he used the points, uh, recognize, resist, replace, reward. Uh, we need to recognize what's going on. God can show us, and Daniel can see this, this would not be right. Uh, resist. Now, he, he didn't rebel. He went to the person in, in charge. He uh, and that's where the third word comes in, replace. He said, can we replace this with something else? He suggested a creative alternative, one man puts it. And then because of that, God rewarded him. God blessed him. God helped him. Uh, later on in, in the verse 15, it says at the end of the, the test, they were fairer and fatter than everybody that ate the, ate the king's meat. And God blessed him because of, of his stand. Temperance. Self-controlled by God's Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, the, the test will come at many different times, many different ways. The, the other example, uh, and I'll quit with that one, Luke chapter 4, is Jesus himself when uh, he was tempted by Satan. Luke chapter 4 and I'll start in verse 1. I typed out notes to give you and I left them home. So. Give them to you anywhere. I'm going to finish this next week, so I'll give them to you then. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when they were ended, he afterward hungered. The devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And, and there's several temptations, as, as you're aware. The devil uh, you know, goes through various temptations, and each time Jesus answers, it is written. And Jesus used, used Scripture to, um, to exhibit temperance, to, to do the right thing. And l let me say this. For you to use Scripture when you're tempted you're going to have to spend some time in God's Word. Um, at least, uh, I, I have a thing I've done over the years that somebody, somebody did where they take heart and hand. They take the letters H-E-A-R-T in your hand, and it, it five different, six different ways that you can use God's Word. The, the first one is hear. You need to at least hear God's Word. Now, nowadays, we can. Now you can get it on your phone. You can get it on CDs and DVDs and you know, your computer and all kinds. We need to be hearing God's word, but we also need to be reading God's word. Now, that doesn't start with an A, that analyze, they, they used, or examine, I think it was. Uh, we, we need to be reading God's word. Uh, we need to be studying God's word. It's not enough just to read it. You, you've probably had it happen. I know I have. You read something, you think, oh, what did I just read? You know, you've got to read it till it, it makes sense. Uh, memorize God's word. Uh, what a blessing that will be. You see, when temptation comes... Uh, Jesus didn't pull out his New Testament and say, oh, now, I know there's a verse on that somewhere. Let, let, just give me a minute. No, uh, he, he, of course, he wrote it. That, that helped. Uh, he, he knew what to say uh, because he, he understood God's word. Uh, we need to think about God's word. Uh, the psalmist wrote, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalm 119, verse 11. Uh, so uh, this thing of, of temperance, we're not looking to our own strength. It's not just self-controlling us. We want self to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We want our self to be controlled by, by God's strength. And God has said it's available. Uh, we have it. And in fact, in 
Is it 1 Corinthians 10? He says, there's no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. So, man, he just took away our excuses, didn't he? We can't say, oh, that was too much. God just, he cranked it up too high. No, God promises he won't let us be tempted above that we're able. If we'll look to him for strength, for temperance, he says we can, we can get through. And he says all these things work together for good. It'll help us. It'll make us more like Jesus Christ. So uh, th that's the beginning. We'll, we'll look next week at some of so a few other things about temperance. Um, Self-control. Uh, you asked about a definition. I, I didn't have a very good definition, didn't I? Did I? Um, if you don't, if you don't use the term self-control, it's kind of hard to know how to how to describe it. Uh, spirit control, God's strength working on me. Uh, I'll come up with a better definition by next week. But uh, temperance, the the word actually comes from the the word that means strength. And the strength, I think, as you the more you look at it, you'll see he's not talking about us. He's talking about the Lord. He's my strength and my song. All right, well, let's quit there. Any, any comments or questions before we take?